Okay, I'm very excited to introduce Omer Sen um, as our speaker this week. Omer is an associate professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Oklahoma State University, and he's um, an expert for scientific machine learning, in particular for data assimilation, digital twins, reduced order modeling, and multi-scale closure modeling of geophysical turbulent flows. Um, he's also the recipient of the DOE 2018 Early Career Award in Applied Mathematics, and today he's going to talk about hybrid physics data modeling and fluid dynamics. I'm very excited for your talk. Um, one question, um, are you okay with um, us asking questions um, during yes. your talk? Okay, I think yes. that's, that's perfect. Um, um, and if, 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 I mean, uh, like, if I may not see, like, I mean, the hands or something like that, I mean, so just, just feel free to ask uh, with voice, I mean, anytime, like, it's, it's perfect. Okay, okay. perfect. Well, and can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for having me here. And then I, uh, I, I will start. I think from the big picture why I get excited about this topic, and then I will move like, I mean, some examples like that we have been doing here for, for last two, three, four, five years. Okay, and then and then here is my kind of big story like uh, why we, why I I like uh, this hybrid idea or what I mean by hybrid physics data modeling. So sometimes we, I just simply call it hybrid modeling, sometimes hybrid modeling analysis. So I mean the, the main uh, idea, like I am originally coming from like more physics-based background. So all my PhD earlier work, like my master, it was all based on like physics-based simulation, high order numerical methods, like compact schemes, larger simulations and CFT mostly, I mean turbulence modeling. And then numerical analysis. And then recently in the last maybe five, six years, so we have been quite exposed with uh, the data, data analysis, data, uh, like data aspects of the like data lear like learning from the data. And then and then there are there are kind of like benefits for both approach. There are like uh, quite a bit of uh, like compelling like uh, strategies like in, in both approach so and then instead of a segregated view of these techniques so instead of oh, okay like you are physics based model okay they are like i mean data driven or vice versa instead of like making a segregation between the approaches so i start to think like more collaborative approach so i mean how i can improve like physics based models like with the help of data or how i can improve database models or, or machine learning models, like by using some logics or some kind of ideas coming from the physics. So I try to make this analogies, this kind of like integration, like uh, quite a few times ago. So then, then things started to emerge as a kind of a hybrid notion, hybrid modeling notion, like over the time. So in, in, in general, so I, I phrase like this, the whole concept as a hybrid analysis and modeling, like, and we simplify just M. So we call it like M, like in our, in our group. So pretty much like with M, the notion like physics-based modeling, P, PBM plus data-driven modeling, DDM. And then we, we, we say it's equal to M. Like, I mean, that's kind of or, or, or simplified equation in this, in this uh, setting. So, and it like, I mean, the synthesis here, like, I mean, we would like to buy this kind of harmony with this integration, we would like to get like more generalizable models, like better accuracies, like better trustworthiness, so like faster mod uh, models. And then as data accumulates, so like self-adaptation, like towards digital tuning and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's kind of like, we hope like to get like that uh, type of benefit with hybrid hybridization, like hybrid analogy. And then I think uh, like in terms of graphically, if I just use the previous kind of uh, visual graphs, like physics-based models and then data-driven models. So here is kind of our uh, like view, like our, our, our visual view, like the, uh, so we respect like the resolved part. So I'm, I'm happy with the physics-based model. So I'm not discarding them. I'm not discarding the, the physic, physical information I may have. So, but I respect the data. So like, I mean, 
uh, from the data, there might be like things that we can learn, we can adapt, we can improve our physics-based models. And then the question is how to kind of these white dots, like this interface point. So how to define like the integration, this two-way coupling between like I mean the models and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a picture view, like about the hybrid, hybrid idea or ham. So we are, I think, not not alone in this journey. I mean, so uh, Misha Chatko from Arizona, so he, I mean, organized like for like, maybe not nowadays like eight eight years, maybe six eight years. Uh, he's organizing physics information learning like workshops, and then his groups like are advancing like lots of techniques. And then Professor Karniadakis, he introduced like physics informed neural network, and then like Karen Wilcox like called like in one of their articles or multiple of their articles like physics based machine learning, and then Professor like Petros Hamosakos, he's calling I think hybrid alloys like hybridization, hybrid alloys like uh, from time to time. And then we call it like in our group most of the time like physics guided machine learning and then theory guided machine learning has been a phrase for computer science people most of the time knowledge inform neural networks neurophysical modeling physics for ml and for physics so then this concept like get get in excited like i mean many people more, get more excited about uh, the the con concept so i I know that this talk is like the consortium is like scientific machine learning, but I, I want to a little bit differentiate between hybrid modeling and scientific machine learning. I think like the community like uh, use scientific machine learning as a kind of, I feel like uh, they, uh, the, the consensus is using machine learning for scientific applications. So, I mean, for if, if we are solving a climate problem or, or stress strain like structural like material science or any any physical problem or, or physical science problem or engineering if we are using like machine learning i mean it's kind of called like scientific machine learning so i think this hybrid idea it is scientific machine learning so we, we want to design like things for science application or scientific application in that sense it is scientific machine learning but it is a subset of scientific machine learning so we try algorithmically or, or in, in, a, in a modeling kind of framework, I mean, how to synthesize, how, 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 how like this, like two different like modeling paradigms will contribute each other. So whether like uh, like physics for ML or ML for physics, so it, like double, I mean, uh, whichever makes more sense for the quantity of interest or, or the problem that we are interested in. So that's kind of uh, the, the idea and then the application. So for, I mean, my my application. So I, like everyone has, might have like different motivations for this like paradigm shift or paradigm like change in, in the modeling frameworks or integrate integration frameworks. So or like my my group philosophy or, or my my background kind of approach is, I believe that like um, it's going to be a key enabler for this digital transformation or the, the digital twinning technologies like for for multiple applications. So I, I view it's going to be in the center of all these developments. So and and I will briefly kind of outline the conceptual framework for the digital twin, at least the way I view it. So it's it's I mean there might be like many different views, but I, I will try to articulate my own like uh, view or interpretation. So we may have a physical asset, could be a wind farm, okay? And then like there might be lots of sensors and everything. And so the in the center, we, we put like the hybrid tools. I mean, it has like all these components like physics-based model, data-driven model, data assimilation, and all the techniques and everything. So I frame in a center box. So, and then, and then the whole concept of all these kind of the models, integrated models, uh, we call it like as a digital twin, like the whole package, we call it as a digital, digital, digital twin. So my definition, uh, I mean, like once we kind of write a, a, a review article on digital twin, we get like lots of feedback from, from our colleagues, like from peers. And then, I mean, the fundamental question was, is this a new thing? I mean, is this like digital twin? Yeah, okay, it is hype and everything, but it, I mean, we, I mean, in our article, I think like we are articulated in such a way that it is not 
I mean, maybe the term digital twin is might be new, or it, it's not that kind of old, but it is a it is a way of the it is another way of the modeling and simulation. So, and then it is not. I mean, we we view it as a kind of a technology that enables all the trajectory of computational science and engineering. So it is an umbrella technology. It is kind of, so you can put anything like uncertainty computation, data assimilation, forward models, backward models, inverse, inverse models, so all of them within this framework. So, I mean, instead of like making this dilemma, is it new or old, is it, I mean, so I we, we as a kind of a framework, as a kind of umbrella framework to be able to like connect all the, all the roots of computational science and engineering for many decades. So that's my, my view from the dig digital theory. And then in terms of asset, it can be used as a kind of feedback, like optimal control to, to asset. It could be used for a decision support systems. And then we may generate like hypothetical scenarios, like, and then we can generate like siblings, like digital siblings, like what if scenarios, uncertain to quantification that can also provide like decision support system. So the whole concept is pretty much like broad general so it can fit to health application or like subsurface uh, or renewable energy so many applications can can be i mean this whole concept can be utilized the key point here in the in the box in the center box and then what are the best techniques and strategies and the integration models for 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 doing like this um, the, uh, the center box so for most of the problem and there is a need for the computational light simulation. So I, I mean, the DNS or even LES runs, they may take like lots of time uh, or computational resources for for many problems, like for majority of the problems. So, and then, and then how we kind of transfer like this, uh, like accuracy, efficiency, balance, like uh, how, how we kind of find the right balance, a, a good strike, within this, this framework. That was the question. That was the underlying uh, thought process, like when, when we when we start uh, this reduced order modeling. And then there might be like different definitions, like or different kind of uh, like use cases, like some some groups may call like coarse graining, reduced order models, or great models, long more. I mean, all these things, I mean, I have my own definition. So like, I mean, these, like segregation is a bit blue, so it may like reduced order modeling may differ for different people. But in my view, in my kind of group, uh, I will focus mostly on like this, a, a two different like subcomponents of these light models. And then these are like, I mean, in, in, the, in the field of like fluid dynamics. So I may call it like one approach as a larger simulation approach, more local based kind of approach. And the other one is like projection based type of approach. So uh, like reduced order model. So, and then that one is not quite like grid type of approach, but it is more kind of model global basis function type of like, uh, it could be POD based function or other based function, but it is more kind of global model. So the, the, the typical uh, difference between them. So one of them still like quite, even if it is like general simulation, it's coarse graining approach, but it may kind of, it's designed to capture the details as much as possible. The other one is really, really, really surrogate model. So I mean, it is a kind of like click and see the results. So I mean, it's kind of like very cheap models that could be used for really fast simulation, near real time simulation, and so on and so forth. So we like in our group we work on these two approach, and then this analogy between them because of the underlying nonlinearity. So the truncated part, truncated modes in, in these figures, uh, I put them like a shaded area, like the, and then I call like as a model over there. So their effects to the large scale, so what we call like the closure problem. So what is the best model or what is the kind of an accurate model, a representative model to account like all these like truncated scales in all resolved parts. So that's kind of the underlying uh, uh, strategy or underlying like the problem that we have been working on over the few years. So, and then uh, like most, mostly, so we work these problems with Romit, Suraj and Shadi, they all uh, finish their like degree, PhD degree here at Oklahoma State. So uh, Romit joined Argonne, Suraj joined Shell recently, and then Shadi joined like Pacific Northwest and joined uh, recently, like um, after this summer. So most of the following uh, 
kind of slides or or res resulting like uh, techniques. So it was a joint work with with these uh, three uh, like researchers. So the first the part one. So in my talk, so uh, brief overview of large dissemination. So we have kind of an underlying equation here. I just put a simple equation, but I mean, we can frame like now we are stocks in this notation as well. So we apply a filter and then that filter reduce, like generates a reduced form, like a, a filtered equation because of the, uh, the definition of the filter, the coarse graining operator. So because of the nonlinearity, we have a, this term, like subfilter term, subgrid scale term. So, and then, and then the whole point is how to approximate them. So, and then I, I mean, there, there are like AD viscosity approaches, like dynamic AD viscosity approaches. So I have been working on like these dynamic models, like you have a one filter, like the grid filter, and then you define a scale, like another scale, like a secondary filter. And then from the analogy, from the kind of link between like a primary filter and a secondary filter dynamically, uh, compute uh, un like unknown coefficients of, of of the model. So it is actually like the in my view like the dynamic similarity model, which is the primary LES models or most common LES models like in the history of LES. I think it is a really nice machine learning over there. So I mean, I, once I learned machine learning after all these things, so I realized that okay. It's it's kind of a learning. So I mean, it's it's a very beautiful idea. Like probably one of the most beautiful idea in, I, I, ideas in in the LES community. So you define a test filter, and then like from this analogy, like I mean, the primary filter and test filter, you learn kind of like scales in the least square sense, and then estimate some coefficients. And I mean, but of course, like uh, like after we kind of started this machine learning part or machine learning uh, or, or neural network based uh, closures or, or, or techniques for large simulation, then, we, then th there becomes like lots of hyperparameters. Okay, like the uh, neural networks, lots of hyperparameters. So like number of neurons, what is going to be the, I mean, like, the, uh, like optimizer, the loss, and then like, the layers, the the art part of the design. I mean, all these hyperparameters becomes a question like how how, how to choose how. To, I mean, the, in 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 the traditional methods, like traditional large simulation methods, we also have hyperparameters. So how to design this uh, scale? Like, what is going to be my secondary filter? So I, am I going to use a kind of uh, Gaussian filter or? Or, or trapezoidal or paddy filter or spectral, I mean, differential filter, uh, hyper differential filter. Uh, I mean, there, there are like this type of things, but it is comparably less uh, if, if we consider like the neural network, like design or, or so th there is no free lunch in none of these models. There will be always like some sort of hyper parameters and then we need to define a scale between them. So what is my, primary scale, what is my secondary scale? So, I mean, the traditional one, the default one, most of the, I mean, I was, when I was coding like large simulation, dynamic semi-gorensi model, I was, most of the time I was using the filter ratio two. I mean, most of the fluid dynamics, I believe like they were using like two as well. So what, I mean, why two? Like, I mean, so that there are, it is also a hyperparameter. So like, I mean, it is, I mean, the, the, my point here, so uh, like, the reason I'm 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 opening like this uh, paragraph here, because like in in all this modeling approach, there will be some sort of hyperparameters. So the question is like, what is uh, like how to approximate, and then like, is it enough to live in that kind of framework, and then is it is is I mean, that, that, does it give like me a, a good kind of representation, or should I move to another another kind of stream like me? Uh, neural networks or more kind of uh, so it will give us like more more chance to kind of approximate something but there will be like negative aspects or overfitting and everything so and then there will be a right balance between them like the, the modeling approach and then how to exploit those type of things that was the kind of starting point for, from my side like when I decided to go with data-driven 
approaches or data driven like models for closures and, and so on and so forth. So the or first point uh, or first starting example was approximate decorrelation. It's an image processing technique before before we jump on on machine learning. So we use this uh, the repetitive kind of uh, it, an iterative process. It is nothing but a Richardson iteration actually in, in, in mathematical jargon. Uh, so we 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 have a a, a filtered quantity so how to kind of convert uh, unfiltered quantity from a filtered quantity by by doing like this one third iteration so and then it has been kind of in 2000 2002 and then the fluid dynamics get excited about this approximate convolution and then they use like i mean these techniques like scale similarity type of approach uh, for 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 sub filter scale modeling and then and then like I, I kind of thought that, oh, okay, like, I mean, here, the question is like the underlying assumption is, okay, I need to know a filter because like, without having a G operator, a filtering operator, without knowing what is G, actual G for, for underlying dynamics, underlying flows, I cannot really convert it back. So I, I need that information. So who gave, gave me like this G operator? So, okay, I can take a elliptic differential filter or hyper elliptic differential filter. It can give me like some results, but how I'm going to sure that like that underlying filter is a good representation for that particular flow field. So what I kind of question myself, okay, like can I learn that filter through data? So, I mean, can I kind of sneak like this, uh, neural networks or, or like machine learning tools to be able to uh, learn a filter. So that was our first actually example in this in this, uh, in this this territory, in this modeling framework. So then we kind of uh, use ANN like, uh, like neural, neural networks to, to, to get like, I mean, uh, we, we, we perform DNS and then we get uh, filtered like we, we, we coarse grain the data and then we get the filtered solution. And then we ask neural network, okay, can you give me back to reco recover? Like, can you recover me back to the true solutions? Like in the coarse grained uh, layout, like, I mean, and, and then it is really coarse. Let's say the DNS is uh, like 512 cube and then the recovered solution is like 64 cube. So in each, in each direction, so, I mean, in a priori setting, it is really good. Like I, what I mean priori, when we have the data, like, I mean, we, if we try to reproduce like the recovered kind of uh, it, like statistical and like turbulent statistics and all, all these like energy spectra, structure function. If you look at all these things in a priori setting, it, it's really giving like good results. But what, have, what, what, what is going on with a, a posterior setting? So can I really use like this technique? So then we kind of, uh, sure, sure. Can I ask you a question, Omar? Thank sure, you. Hey, yeah. that's, that's. Yeah, how are you? Yeah. Uh, hey. So Omar, this one, when you go back, is it like a, when, you, when you're recovering it, are you recovering it from deconvolution of the G or are you recovering it from like, Super resolution from the data itself. I mean, he, he, here, yeah. Th thanks, Payman. So uh, let me cl clarify. So we we in in approximate deconvolution. So here in this formula, the, in, in the bottom formula. So uh, to be able to recover the field from the filtered field, I mean, we we need this G operator. So if 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 you if you say okay, your G is a uh, a Gaussian filter with certain certain parameters, certain Gaussian parameters, and then if 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 I if I trust that filter, if I kind of say that okay, that's the filter uh, which which is suited for this problem. I mean, the recovery is going to be like a, a few iterations. So once we do like a few once the iterations, we will really recover uh, the target the the. The, the the unfiltered quantities, the original quantities. So, but but G is not kind of, I mean. So I mean, how I am going to sure that like that that G operator is is available to me? Like I mean. So then then in this 
case in AN. And so we bypass all these kind of uh, iterative process, okay? And then we lump uh, as a kind of like, like super resolution type of approach, but it is the link between the closure and the original variable. So I have a, in my solver, I have the original variables like velocity, pressure, whatever, like I mean. Uh, so, and then, and then from the original resources, uh, the directly map to the like, uh, like original variables. So it is kind of a super resolution type of approach. I mean, but in just not just for the quantities, but for the uh, closure term, for the stress term, so for the for the residual terms. Okay, my, my, my question is the one that you have the filtered result when you go recover, that filter result is on, on the coarse grid or you use the values on all of the all of the grids. No, no, no. The, it, on, only coarse grids. Only so, coarse okay, so it's just a lot lower uh -huh. resolution than the original. Yeah, yeah. All, all these mapping training and everything they happens on the coarse core like like coarse coarse grid scales. Okay. And 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 uh, the, I mean, this this was our starting point. Like this was like our first work, work actually. Like I mean, around 2016 and 17. So that makes us happy. Oh, okay. Like it, I can like I can dedicate quite a bit of time to learn like more about like because like I'm not a computer. I'm, my background is, was not from like computer science. I didn't officially take any machine learning. So I was just excited about like I mean. 2016 area like about these neural networks and everything so this was our first kind of attempt oh, okay like i mean there is something going on maybe like i mean we can utilize these techniques or these technologies for fluid dynamics so that was our like the light bulb in in the beginning like and then and then and then the the, the first question came to my mind okay if i train uh, in low reynolds number case like in the top let's say the top uh, in in this figure, the top fields. If I if I if I train this filter uh, by low Reynolds number data, can I get a good representative results for if I would like to use this trained filter for high Reynolds number flows or or uh, like like more involved like the vertical structures and everything is more dense and everything. So can I really transfer like the the day uh, the filter like the train filter into the like higher Reynolds number so I mean that was the first question so then we realized that okay like there is uh, quite a bit of good accuracy the energy statistics and everything came out like nice I mean not maybe super nice but it's okay uh, acceptable so then then we we kind of make a decision at that time so okay let's continue to understand further what's going on the limitation of these technologies and then how we can utilize those things for uh, for fluid dynamics so but the, the the challenge here so all these like data generation training for 3d becomes like quite a bit of challenge like the input outputs and renderings and everything so we step back uh, a little bit to 2d turbulence so and then and then we we formulated most of the problems uh, in in 2D because like if 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 we understand all this machine learning like the benefits pros and cons of all these techniques in 2D we can extrapolate back into 3D so we we become like I mean more interested in 2D settings because like data generation pre-processing post-processing training and everything is going to be like relatively easy for for, for 2D set, setup and and the same same kind of like concept is is there like the closures the filtered uh, variables unfiltered variables or oh, everything is going to be pretty much like similar in in 2d as well so uh, in terms of one aspect so the, the closure aspect so of course like there is no vortex stretching term in in 2d i mean like it's kind of like we cannot i mean gen we cannot say that like oh, okay like one thing is working on 2D, it's going to for sure will work on 3D. I mean, I'm not making that that statement, but I mean, we were trying to learn more machine learning approaches, like more, more like, I mean, how can we kind of tune like machine learning things or, or these neural network approaches for fluid dynamics. So, uh, and then and then what, what we did, okay, we first say that, okay, in my solver, okay, I may have like my variable. So in, in this case, the vorticity. I mean, in, if, if we are using primitive variable formulation, it might be velocity and pressure as well. So 
I mean, that information is in my subroutine, in my data, like when, when we write the solver. So, but I also have additional like features. So it, it, it might be a strain kind of uh, information, strain rate tensor information. It could be like velocity gradient information, uh, vortice gradient information. So in my subroutines, in my solvers, I have also that terms already computed or already, I mean, it's easy to compute. So can I, can I kind of do a little bit future engineering? So if I kind of add like additional features in my training, okay, in, when, I, when I train a, a neural network, am I going to get a better result or not? So is it going to be like helpful or not? So we ask like that, that question, like that hypothesis. And then we see that, yeah, okay, like it's really good. So we, we see that like, I mean, in, in this plot, so I am plotting like the energy spectrum. So one of them is like without any kernels, without any kernels means like I am learning from raw, raw data, like field data. And then with, with kernels means like I am adding like some additional features. So in this case, like strain rate uh, and, the, and the words the gradient features as an input, as an additional input. And then we realize that it reduced the uh, uncertainty, it, it, it improves the accuracy. So then, then it, it makes us like a better hope. Oh, okay, like I mean, so there is a room to improve like plain vanilla neural networks or pl plain vanilla, like I mean, learning, learning structure. So then we kind of use that type of things as an inductive bias. So we, if we add like more inductive bias to our systems or learning engine, so we may kind of get a more appropriate or more accurate kind of. Uh, results. So then I will I will detail all these like philosophy or all, all, all these like hypotheses in a in a follow up in a backup like uh, like testing. So in in the next in, in the next few slides. So the the inductive bias or or what we call like physics guided machine learning. Like later we we, we framed as a as a PGML. So what what we mean here? So we we may have a data driven engine. So and then. But on the other hand, we have like lots of other techniques, theories, like approximate, like asymptotic laws, and then simplified models, like boundary layer, maybe profiles. And then so, I mean, that in fluid dynamics, there are lots of uh, like scaling laws and asymptotic theory. I mean, how can I incorporate like this information or pre-information in the history of fluid dynamics to my recovery engine, to my learning engine? So th then we started to kind of elaborate further uh, on, on, on those kind of pre-information. So adding inductive bias. And then a few months ag ago, I think two months ago, uh, Facebook like Meta uh, also introduced a package, a new package. Uh, so uh, it is called like thesis. I mean, I think just a few months ago, maybe maybe six weeks ago or, or, or six, seven weeks ago, they introduced like this new, new so that's exactly resonates what we were we have been doing in, in, in my group. So we were trying to add like I mean this pre knowledge, pre information to the learning engine. Uh, of course, like we haven't used the meta meta thesis like uh, package yet, but I assume that it is going to be very more kind of automated or generalized than what we have been doing in, in my group. So I think in in my future future kind of. Uh, like future students in my group might use like this maybe meta package like for further verification testing and, and so on in, in the future, but it is available. So the, it, it is publicly available this package. So uh, we will we will check it out like uh, later. I mean, how, how we can incorporate these techniques or this package for fluids application. But what we did in locally here, uh, like we just tested like this flat plate. It is it is the beautiful example. So fluid dynamics, including myself, loss like this example flat plate. So we have like uh, Blazier solutions for flat plate, or we have uh, for like power loss, like one 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 seven power loss for for velocity profile. So we expect that the, the learning should be like somehow like the boundary layer profile, the expected profile should respect like this. Power law. That's an information like it's out there in all fluid dynamics books, in White's books, in like uh, Schlichting's like boundary layer books, and everywhere. So we, we we all get like that type of 
equation. So the question is like the first question I ask myself, okay, I have this field like the flat blade and then I generate a field like flow field. Okay, and then I randomly like uh, distribute like points. Okay, and then I, I, I collect that point. So now the goal is like from these points, I would like to make a, a engine like a learn. Um, I would like to learn. Uh, I would like to make a neural network to learn like the flow, like a super resolution type of approach. I would like to learn the uh, flow field from from these like sensor sensor data. Once we learn, so uh, I would like to compare a velocity profile along along certain certain points. So here is the result. Okay, if we do uh, like. 5%, 10%, and 30% in this in this in this picture. So 5% means that I am just using 5% of the sensor information in my training. I, I mean, so if 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 I have like uh, 1,000 grid points, I am just using 50 grid points in in training. And for 10%, I am using like 100 grid points, and then for 30%, I am using just 300 grid points out of like the total grid points, uh, 1000 grid points. So it is the it is the percentage of the data. So the top one is the pure machine learning without this inductive bias. And then the second layer, it is the physics guided machine learning where we incorporate this inductive bias in all learning engines. So the power law, uh, the, the one seventh law, which is an analytical information, which is a like, I mean, it, it I don't have to spend any time. So the learning time, the training time, they are similar in both approaches. In one of them, I'm just adding additional bias. And then as we see in, in these figures, it significantly reduce the uh, uncertainty of the model. So this, this orange bar is the uh, two standard deviation band, uh, the uncertainty. Where this uncertainty came from? So in machine learning, instead of just training one model, so I train here 20 different machine, like different hyperparameter, different initialization. I, I train like different number of machine learning. And then I am looking the mean of these machine learning models and the standard deviation of these machine learning models in both of the case. The difference is one of them has inductive bias. And then as we see that, uh, like even 5% of the data used in the training, the uncertainty reduced significantly. And then if I just zoom out, like here, if I just zoom out, like to see that what's going on really like in the boundary layer profile, boundary layer uh, part of the domain, like the pure machine learning, the top, the top figures, pure machine learning, it is not able to capture the, this velocity profile, the boundary layer velocity profile from the available data. Like, I mean, because the, there is no in, not enough data and then like it doesn't understand or it doesn't know like it's going to curve this way I mean the boundary layer profile because the, there is no that information it is just based on the data and then if there is not enough data in that zone it is not able to see or it's not able to capture or it's, it's not able to give me like this velocity profile and then there is a huge uncertainty over that but the other one I am using the same amount of data from the same place I mean, but I I induct a bias like the power law over there, and then it's it's captured the trend over there with reduced uncertainty. So this gives us hope. Okay, so whenever we train a, a, a neural network, so why we discard the physical information or physical insight? If I know that like I mean my boundary has to respect like zero zero like uh, no slip boundary condition, and if there is going to be a a, a kind of a, a power law over there why just rely on the data or, or the sensor data or I mean I can utilize that information that was the kind of motivation and then we see that like quite a bit of uh, improvements over there so tell oh, me Omar, that, Omar, you, can I ask you this are all in the context of RANS correct this are you know this profile that you're trying to match would be basically in the context of RANS or are you doing in the context of LES and then ensemble averaging no, no, no. It is it is just rents. I mean, all the, the the data in this case it is it is it is generated. Uh, it is an open open. I mean, uh, the the forward simulation uh, use like rents. I mean, to generate the data for for tra for for training. So we just 
did a kind of aesthetic training test here. So we, I mean, once we generate the data, so we try to understand is this inductive bias is helping to us or not. So it it, it was a static test in, in that case. I mean, it is steady state solution for lens actually in, in this example. There is no time involved here. And, and uh, the second example to test uh, for myself, like, I mean, uh, I mean, can I really uh, rely on this inductive bias? So then, then I ask that question. Okay, I have a panel method. So in my in my undergraduate courses, like in Istanbul Technical University, like one of our homework was like the panel method, like writing codes for Hessimit panel methods. So like using like this traditional uh, techniques like panel methods. So and then for a given airfoil shape. These panel methods, we all know that like even if you use like other packages like XFOIL or anything, so we know that like it is a like click and see, like it is subsequent, like the computational time, like for, for a panel method, so finding this like uh, like angle of attack and then the CL curve, it's going to be like really easy process, like I mean. So now the question is like if I have a CFT data, like and then and then and then like bunch of like different airfoils, if I if I have like all these like uh, runs data or CFT data, and then if I generate like this CL and alpha curve for different different airfoils, okay, and then I see that like there are lots of studies on on the aerodynamics like using like this N and or neural network to to get like these curves, okay. I mean it is it, it is important because it it digitizes the data and then it it will give us like I mean fast kind of models like I mean in in many cases. So then I ask okay. A question. I have also a panel method. Okay, in my training, okay, if the input is an airfoil shape, I can take that input in my training. Okay, I can write a, a kind of a script, like, a, or I can use an XFOIL to generate a, a prior information. So if I would use a potential flow theory for this particular shape, my kind of result is going to be this. So I, I may have like a, a kind of a prior information uh, coming from a panel method, okay? And then I use that information in my training, okay? And then I train by using like this panel inside the training. And then we realize that like it reduced the uncertainty of the of the CFT kind of simulation. So, or it might be experimental simulation as well. Uh, or ex ex like based on the experimental data. So my, my my bottom line from this example, like I mean the, the take home message from this example, if we have a, a additional information from uh, somewhere, like could be asymptotic theory or could be like reason, like fast uh, method, like panel method or so on and so forth. This can, even if it is potential irrotational flow, it can help like I mean to induct like uh, to guide the training agent or, or the uh, the training model. So, and then we we kind of uh, thought or thought process like makes a check mark. Okay, like this inductive bias, it is really kind of working. Like most of the situation, almost all situation we have kind of apply like th th this inductive bias. We realize that it is it is helping like at, at a certain certain degree because it adds like the bias so then I then uh, I would like to illustrate like this topic uh, in a in a kind of a different setting. So it will give us like a, a bit further insights why it might kind of help. So we we know like I mean this once like this convolutional neural network becomes like popular and then it has been used. So at that time like I mean. In, in fluid dynamics world or in the most of the fluid dynamics applications, so we don't use this pre-trained like giant like I mean models. But in in this image processing community or or like uh, we have like this let's say one of the example YOLO like you 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 only look once like that that is a pre-trained like neural network for for detection and then it's it has like more than hundred layers I mean and then lots of skip connection it is more of and art, right? I mean, like if I mean, sometimes like this machine learning like things becomes like more of art rather than science. But I mean, it is a huge kind of uh, arch architect over there. And then we we use like in in practice we use like this YOLO several years ago 
for detecting like fish from the recorded video. So we like there is an apparatus over there. You dive in uh, see, and then uh, it it records like videos. And then from the video, so we detect like how many fish we kind of uh, see. So it works like, I mean, even if like that pre-trained, like even if we use this pre-trained like uh, detection algorithm, uh, we, we will be able to detect like at a fair accuracy, like how many fish we have in our videos instead of counting by them. Uh, I mean, it automates like the, the process, like it's helpful, it automates the process. So then we ask, question okay what is going on like i mean th there is like this hundred layers of st stacking data and then once we have a new image that image new input goes to internal layers all the way down to, to the neural network like from one layer to another layer so the data transform in, in each layer and then at the end of the day it says that oh okay like it is a fish or it is kind of cat dog or whatever so then we want to uh, we want to understand what's going on there. So here is an example. So this is a field. Uh, this is a picture. Uh, it is painted by Adil Rashid, like one of my my friend, my colleagues uh, in in Norway. So he painted like this lavanda field by, by himself. So he's a really good painter. Uh, so we we see like I mean a tree, like few houses, and uh, I mean. For YOLO algorithm, this pre-trained algorithm, there is no way for that algorithm to see this picture. This, this picture is not included in that YOLO training regime because this is a very special picture. It is not available online and so on and so forth. So then we, we, we wanted to look at what is going on. Okay, if I give like this input image to that algorithm, that pre-trained algorithm, how it evolves through the layers of the neural network that was kind of our or uh starting point actually like all 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 these inductive bias all these processes so what i expect okay at the end of the day it should give me like it should detect like the maybe mountain maybe like house maybe like the tree but i should emphasize like in the training so all these like yolo algorithm it has been trained like millions of images so like snakes castles and people like cats and dogs so there are zillions of different different uh, image has been included like in that yolo algorithm like this giant pre-trained algorithm so but that particular image was not included so and then in the following gif like in the following uh, gif i'm going to run like i mean the the data that's going on like between like one filter to another filter one filter like one layer to another layer to another layer to another layer through like the uh so here is a journey okay at the end of the day we would expect like it will detect us uh this one so to, to see like this detection the data goes like this way so it like all data goes like okay like i mean cats and dogs and these fractals and then like i mean like for this particular image it like it is kind of understand it tries it tries to understand what is going on over there but there are lots of cats and dogs or oh, oh, man, is this is this the near the campus of Oklahoma State or something uh, this picture no I'm just kidding sorry <laughs> just, it, 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 it is it is in uh, I assume it is in Europe <laughs> I mean I mean I, I, I mean but but but, the, but 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 my point here uh, I mean, Adil, like, uh, like Adil, like he has like uh, a Rashid Academy actually. I mean, he was kind of uh, teaching like kids, like uh, like teenagers, uh, these oil painting classes, like for some time ago. So uh, he he's he has like a couple of YouTube videos. I mean, watch like like maybe millions of times. So he's 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 teaching like this oil painting to, to community over there. And this is one of his paintings, like lavanda, lavanda field. And then we, we see like many, many kind of like things going on in the internal layers. At the end of the day, it gives us like this tree house. And I mean, but the data goes like in many different things. So it, it checks like, okay, is it dog or cat or this or so in inductive bias, what we are trying to do. Okay. At any layer, or, or, so we say that, oh, okay, like, I mean, 
there is a boundary layer over there. Don't approximate as a flat flat profile. So I mean, the physics tells us like there is a boundary layer. So at each layer, so we kind of like uh, make it like oh, okay, like go go go, like go go go. So I mean, automatically like we we say that yeah, okay, you should at the end of the day you should kind of like came closer like to 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 kind of. Uh, the flat plate or, or or something like that. That was our kind of motivation in the beginning. Uh, I mean, initially I thought that it is kind of a little bit cheating. Like, I mean, I mean, we, we, I mean, we try pre-information, I mean, while training. So I thought that like computational science people will not like it, that approach. But like later I convinced myself, okay, why am I going to discard that information? So at the end of the day, I know that like, I mean, uh, a turbulent flow has to be like, I mean, like energy spectrum should be like K to the minus five third, let's say, for 3D turbulence. So if I use that information when I train a, a model, a, a data driven model for, for turbulence, I mean, why I'm not going to use it? So then I, I justify myself. So, okay, like if I use like that information, a spectral law or a, or, or a power law, when I design a data driven engine for a purpose, so why I discard that information? I can use that information. And then we see that like if we use that information, we are able to uh, recover uh, using less amount of data. Instead of like 30% of the data, I can train my network just by 5% of the data in a better accuracy by reduced uncertainty. So then I started to believe like more and more, okay, like there is a benefit in this uh, inductive bias, uh, like adding inductive bias. So that was, uh, one one part of the puzzle. Then we ask we, we I'm going to change the gear here into another 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 topic. So it is it is uh, the, uh, all these like I mean uh, uh, like invariance properties of of the recovery. Okay, so uh, like CNN or or uh, it is uh, it is by default like translation invariant and Galilean invariant, but the default CNN is not rotational invariant. So in our first couple of paper, we use default CN CNN. And then we realize that, yeah, it is good, but it is not super good. So then later we ask, is there any way we can make uh, like this rotational invariant? So one way is data augmentation. So I can take any input and then I can kind of like rotate my input, like I from one input image, I can generate like eight different input at 45 degrees, and then I can train my network. So this is one way of doing like rotational invariance. Then we figure out like uh, like uh, like there is another way. Uh, there is another way of doing uh, that uh, rotational invariance by using like equivariant CNN from from University of Amsterdam, like Max Willings group. So then we use that one, and then I will show you like the uh, very preliminary uh, example. So, I mean, the vortex, vortex like uh, two Gaussian vortices, like I use as an initial condition, two Gaussian vortices in this setup. And then, and then, and then it evolves by time. And then we collect like the snapshots and then we train and then we get like this closure content. So here, what we get, like, this is the closure, uh, like some field for the closure, like from the true data. And then the, if I if I would do like uh, myself, like I mean from the from the true data rather than the uh, the model, like the machine learning model, it is very very good. Like I mean, like it is expected. Like I mean, it's because we train by using that data. So the question is like, once I train this model from this evolution of these Gaussian vortices, just simple isolated two vortices, like very simple setup. If I just rotate uh, my vortices this way and then let it go, I mean, I don't need a machine learning. Uh, so I can I can easily I can easily uh, say that I mean if I if I if I rotate it this way, my closure content should be rotated. So, but the machine learning the CNN doesn't understand. Like oh. once you, once once we train. The CNN, if you rotate it and then use the same trained CNN, but 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 it is trained, already trained. 
So I just rotate. It is not able to understand the rotational invariance. So it messed up. So imagine that like in turbulent flow, so we have like bunch of rota uh, vortices like interacting each other. And then, then I realized that all oh, first couple of paper was totally garbage. I mean, because we were using like this type of like methods to get all these things. And then, yeah, okay, like it's like, it is good, but not super good. It was like statistically okay. But I mean, then we realized that, okay, we have to respect like this rotational invariance, like this rotational. Uh, sure. It, sure. So, I'm sorry. I, is, it, is it what happened if G is a, is a differential filter? Would you still get the same thing? If I use a differential filter for this, would you get the same, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, like, I mean, the CNN, uh, like, if if it doesn't see like the the other, like the other set of snapshots from uh, different initial condition, the rotated initial condition, if we don't see like, it is going to be like, again, like bad results. So, I mean, it it is independent of 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 other other aspects. I think it 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 doesn't like the pure pure CNN like I mean the default vanilla version of the CNN available in PyTorch or TensorFlow it is not able to do like these rotational things by I mean by default so so what what we did okay we use like this max willings like I mean this uh, like uh, invariant CNN so I mean it automatically does this data augmentation within the CNN so it adds additional channels like it had additional channels for the CNN and then based on the, uh, you define a parameter. Okay, I'm going to generate like eight times. So like at every 45 degrees, so it will kind of like minimize all these weights and everything in such a way that it augments like internally uh, within the package internally uh, to satisfy these rotational invariance properties. So once we do it that way, okay, I, I, now I, in the last column, I use this rotational invariant CNN. As expected, like for the train, like for the same data set, it is okay. But even if I use like I'm in the uh, unseen condition, a different initial condition, it is still like giving a really good result because now it respects this rotational invariance. Then, then we test it like I mean, uh, this idea with the, uh, 2D, like lots of vortices. Now they are all interacting each other. And then we kind of see that like it captured the tails of like this, uh, like probability density function really nice. So we train by using like 16,000 like Reynolds number and then we tested like a uh, higher Reynolds number. And then it beats like the dynamic Simogorensky model. Like it, it captured like the details. And then, I mean, we, we see that like quite in, quite good results in, in this testing, like rotational invariance. And then and then if we look at more importantly, like if we look at the energy spectra in earlier times, so the green, the green curve here, the green line here in the energy spectra is the regular CNN. The red curve here is the frame invariant CNN. So this equivalent uh, like rotational equivalent uh, C CNN. So in early times, we don't see much difference. Both of them is working okay. So because the error is not accumulated yet in the regular CNN. I mean, in our first paper, so we, we, we couldn't get that kind of differentiation. Uh, so, but, but later we figure out like, if we use like later in time, once error is uh, like accumulated. So this, rota uh, this regular CNN uh, like gets like, I mean, energy pileups and then it goes like, I mean, it, it makes the codes blow up. So, but if we respect this rotational invariant symmetry, even if in later times, it, it is not blowing up, it is still like capturing like the inertial range uh, in, a, in a fairly accurate way. So, I mean, we see that like quite a bit of good, uh, good performance, let me put it that way. And, and I will finish in a, in a, in a few minutes. I mean, I have two more slides, I think. Uh, to, to That's totally of, fine. Take your time. Uh, to kind of, to kind of wrap it up. So, uh, we we have another kind of line of research in related to this kind of things. Instead of making a, instead of making a kind of a regression type of approach, we ask, okay, can we utilize like these techniques as a 
classifier. So can I can I make a classification based like uh, engine? Uh, because like in open form in many uh, computational infrastructure, we have like bunch of different methods already available. So I have like option one, option two, option three, option four. So in any package, like in any uh, computational infrastructure, we have lots of different LES models already built in. So instead of like making a data driven, okay, can I make a, a engine, a detector, okay, for this type of flows, I'm going to use this or this part I'm going to use. So can I kind of make this type of classification? Like, and then here we, we did like very simple example by using, uh, so like between dynamic semi scan, uh, Bardina model or approximately called like between like structural and functional model. We see that, yeah, okay, like I can, by, by switching like from one model to another model by evolving like the uh, time, so I can get a, a nice kind of approximation. So this, this is one kind of approach. So the, uh, the, these engines can be used as a classifier as well. And then, and then in another approach, so we may have like different numerics as well. So like sometimes like we have like uh, non-dissipative schemes like central schemes, six order father schemes, or like, I mean, like, or we may have up in, schemes like Vino schemes or like fifth order Vino or third order Vino or first order sometimes like uh, up in schemes like if you really need like high, high dissipation. So, I mean, in any solver, there might be like lots of different uh, options available. So can I kind of train an agent, okay, to learn a hypothesis, okay, uh, for this type of the flow or this type of the region, if there is a shock wave or if there is a discontinu discontinuity. So let's use like this type of numerical schemes. If it is smooth and everything, use this type of numerical scheme. So that type of like a classification based approach can be also utilized by using machine learning. So we did like a couple of examples on these things. So, I mean, another thing is adaptive mesh refinement. So we can kind of use machine learning to detect like the, uh, the the grid, like to make layout the grid. And then we can use like a physics-based solver on that grid. So because like I was working on like wavelet type of approach. So I was using wavelets to generate grid. And then I was using uh, compact schemes to solve the equation. So that machine learning exactly fits to that kind of uh, idea, this hybridization idea. So I can use like the, the, the machine learnings for gridding. Okay, and then I can use a physics space solver for, for, for simulation. So the reason like I'm, I, I'm telling this like adaptive mesh refinement. So when I was using like uh, the wavelet type of, when I was coding wavelet type of approach, so 1% of the time, con time of, of the solver was actual components. 99% of the data allocation was uh, ghost points. So to be able to make all these kind of things work, so we introduced lots of ghost points in in, in particular uh, approach, and then that all cost lots of time. So then, like a typical kind of practitioner may conclude that okay, like I'm spending lots of time for this adaptation. Like instead of like making time for all these like ghost points and adaptive mesh refinement strategies. So I am going to use like a simple straightforward grid, double the grid, and then I will use pure MPI, like I mean the parallel computing, and I, I will get the job is much faster. So that's kind of like the dilemma between like the adaptive mesh refinement and versus like very standard. So now I, 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 I started to think that, okay, like I can, if I embed all this grid, like I mean all these machine learning for, grid adaptation and everything in a fast way. I mean, even if like it is statistically okay, but it is not that accurate. So my numerical method will catch it. Like we kind of like correct it from one step to another step. So there is a room like in, in many computational science and engineering fields, whether it is adaptive mesh refinement, whether it is closure, whether it is like a cyber infrastructure, like development for, for solver. So there is lots of rooms for developing this hybridization. So it is like, in my view, like, I mean, it is better to kind of like uh, synthesize like the approaches according to the needs, like what is the needs, I mean, by understanding the need first and then uh, designing the engines and everything according to that one. I think that's way to kind of go. So I will stop here. So this, I mean, 
I have another uh, like portion for um, reduced order model, like projection based reduced order model. So pretty much like what we did for the larger simulation, we also extrapolated for projection based methods, like POD based methods, and, and, and then like uh, auto encoder based methods. So we have a set of like results for that one. But for the sake of time, I will I will stop here and then I will take questions for for the first part. Okay, that's I think uh, uh, that's I think uh, the the end of my my talk. So I'm happy to take questions. I mean, uh, thank you so much. This uh -huh. was really really exciting. Um, yeah, let's open the floor for questions. I mean, I, I can start maybe with, with one question. Um, so you, you, you said like um, you use simple data augmentation schemes like rotation. Have you looked into more sophisticated strategies that are recently were proposed, AugMax or um, um, particular um, strategies which also start to mix um, um, features in, in latent space and not just in input space and how this affects like the performance or where basically what you what you were doing just um, good enough already? Uh, I mean, uh, for LES part of the, uh, for larger simulation part, we haven't kind of go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, but for ROM part, for, for project, I mean, for surrogate modeling or like more coarse grain, like more near real time, like things. So we, we utilize like uh, that uh, inductive bias type of approach uh, or, or or finding a better latent space. I mean, for, for in the ROM settings. So in, yeah. in not not for the LES settings, but uh, Shadi, like one of one of one of the uh, students, like recently graduated here. So he he worked on that type of things, but uh, it was mostly like ROM setting, like reduced order modeling setting, not not for the LES setting. So Suraj worked on mostly in LES setting. So today. I just cover what Suraj did actually, like during his PhD. I mean, so <laughs> the second part was the was the part uh, from the Shadi, like the the other students. So I I didn't kind of co co cover that, that that much, but I think uh, like that's very, very like I mean very very good point. So it might be like I mean uh, like yeah we I mean we haven't kind of fully uh, used the the approach that you mentioned. Yeah. I mean so. Uh, we haven't tested. I will check it out, but yeah. uh, but we we started. So let me put it that way. So we we, we started by using like I mean this Max Willings like approach, like yeah. uh, and then I think there is room. So there is room for exploration, like in, in multiple directions. So it's it will come, I think, soon, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can talk more offline uh -huh. um, about this. But uh, I'm, I'm in general very interested in in data augmentation strategies. And I'm curious, like they're mainly tailored to computer vision um, applications. So it would be interesting to think a bit more how, how they can be used in scientific applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 would, that would be like, that would be really okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, Omar, can sure. I ask you one question? Uh, uh, it seems that you know there are lots of things that you you, you are just saying. You know, it is application for you know like LES or RANS and fluid. Uh -huh. but uh -huh. I would say that it has application in almost in everything, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah. I don't see any you know like uh, any reason that is applied to fluids. So my question is, where does the you know how do you how do you satisfy some of the conservative laws when it comes to fluid dynamics? Does it, does it, is it implemented into the model somehow, or is it primarily through the machine learning part? Is there any optimization of minimizing the cost function associated with the transport equation or anything like that? Yes, that's, that's, that's very nice point. So I can kind of link it through like this. So, uh, whenever we design like this uh, engines, like this learning engine, so I mean there is the definition of this loss function. So and then and then we can always like add, uh, I mean the uh, the equation, the conservation, like as a, as a kind of abstract level to a, as a loss function as a regularizer, and then uh, that's what 
Professor Karniadakis uh, has been promoting like uh, like many for many years. So th th there is there is kind of like room to use like this physics in form. So we, we can kind of like define a kind of a loss function, a new loss function to our equation. And then, I mean, that is there. So we can always like make a, a, an option for any of our techniques. Okay, okay. You, we use like that option on and off. So we, I mean, we, we did like lots of comparison actually with on and off. So it depends on like, I mean, sometimes like the combination of both approaches gives a better result. Uh, like I mean, the, oh, it it all depends on like the the level of overfitting actually, like the level of like I mean the uh, how much data I have, what is the uh, like how hard the problem itself it is, and then so it is not a kind of a very concrete answer. Okay, uh, like always, like we need to use both. I mean, most of the time we see that like I mean the loss function uh, addition, like I mean if we kind of add a loss function uh like coming from conservation laws helps better i mean in terms of uh, in terms of the performance we observe here in locally in our group as well so i mean that's kind of uh, one way i mean but it is not the only way i think like how to kind of pose this conservation into like this this loss function is one option so uh, Misha Charkos, like I mean, R. R. M. Mohan, Misha Charkos. So they kind of like define uh, another approach uh, several years ago. Like I mean, this uh, like uh, like trainable and non-trainable part of the neural. So we define like I mean different kind of networks. Uh, I mean composite networks or different networks, and then and then we can try to incorporate like uh, additional residual. So we can learn something, and then. Uh, so my, my approach is like my personal take on from all these like different experimentation within our group. So uh, like I I want this like hybridization, like especially for LES type of things. So instead of learning purely from data, especially for, for fluids application, like instead of an end-to-end -end learning from data and then an end-to-end -end inference tool, okay. I'm more tempted to have a, a, a coarse grained simulators, like it could be like as coarse as possible. I mean, but by using could be like, I mean, I can use a coarse grained simulations for upwind schemes. So I can use a really upwind, like a really coarse upwind scheme. Okay. And then it can give me like some sort of like, I mean, coarse grain simulation. And then I can fine tune like the details. I can kind of fine tune like the additional layers of information, uh, like additional closures and additional kind of things through the machine learning, through the data, through the sensor data. And then I can use a dynamic data assimilation techniques coming from the data, uh, coming from the real time sensor. And then I can use all these like, I mean, ensemble filters, ensemble Kalman filters or other filters to kind of correct my uh, my composite schemes, like my hybrid schemes, my hybrid solver through the data. So I, I will be fast enough. I will be fast enough to solve, but it is going to be like the core of the solver will respect the uh, conservation law. That's the key part. So the core of the solver, it's going to be physics based. So the the additional component will be corrective. So I will use machine learning as a correction scheme to my physics, okay? And then I will use final data, uh, the streaming data, the final uh, observation data, real-time data, uh, with the da dynamic data assimilation techniques to merge like the correction. So, oh, I mean, it is kind of, in my view, it is kind of a Pareto front. So I try to utilize like, forward solver, the physics solvers, and the corrections, I mean, the machine learning, and then like data streaming, like the online data availability uh, in, a, in, a, in a synthesized way to be able to came up with a, a predictive tool, what we call like a, a digital twin, like or, or the core of the digital twin. I mean, that's kind of my, 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 my overview, like I mean, about what, I mean, we try to kind of like approach as a modular way. I mean, as, as much as possible. So, but I mean, conserving, I mean, coming back to your question, conserving the mass momentum and uh, other like conservation laws in end to end 
uh, scheme. But if for an end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning, it is not an easy task. I haven't seen anyone uh, kind of fully uh, came to that point yet. So I haven't, I mean, in my group, we haven't figured out how to make it yet. I mean, and I haven't seen anyone like, I mean, if 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 it is a pure end-to-end -end, like machine learning, it is still an open question, like how to kind of conserve like all these things, like whatever the machine learning puts out over there, uh, how to make sure that it is kind of like uh, respecting all grid points, all the data is like uh, the residual is going to be zero, like whatever the conservation law residual. I mean, we may use it in loss function, but it doesn't make sure that like the, the output is going to be like that way. So it just helped, it just regularized one way, but it doesn't make sure, it, it doesn't make uh, like we are not 100% sure. I mean, uh, it's going to be that way. And then I haven't seen anyone yet came to that conclusion. So we are also thinking, like we are also actively thinking how to how to incorporate them. Uh, but it is an open right. question. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We have, we have to get you here on campus so we can discuss this in detail. Okay. <laughs> thank and th thank you for- hey. Absolutely. Yeah, Thanks yeah, for, yeah. for the great uh, talk. And my, my appreciation. Thank you for having me here. So uh, let I mean, me let me stop the recording and then we can talk a bit more.